All right, y'all, welcome to the Scott Horton Show. I'm the director of the Libertarian Institute, editorial director of Antiwar.com, author of the book Fool's Errand, Time to End the War in Afghanistan, and the brand new Enough Already, Time to End the War on Terrorism. And I've recorded more than 5,500 interviews since 2003, almost all on foreign policy and all available for you at scotthorton.org. You can sign up for the podcast feed there. And the full interview archive is also available at youtube.com slash Scott Horton Show. Hey guys, on the line, I got Eli Clifton. He's one of the main guys over there at the Quincy Institute. That's uh, responsiblestatecraft.org. Welcome back to the show, Eli. How you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Happy to have you here. Man, you've got this great article all about what a corrupt, evil empire America is. Ukraine war is great for the portfolio as defense stocks enjoy a banner year. So you might even put a correlation and a causation on how poorly other stocks are doing as all our money is confiscated and poured into destruction. But uh, anyway, do tell about the big five, as you call them here. Well, I, I, I think you pretty much nailed it. It's you know Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, Boeing, Northrop Grumman, and General Dynamics, which make up pretty much a, a huge portion of the uh, defense and we weapons sector in the United States, and actually globally. Uh, and these companies, exactly, when you compare it to the performance of other stocks, did shockingly well in the past year. And I use the one-year mark being the day before Russia's invasion of Ukraine until the one-year anniversary. And, and what I found in comparing them is that on average, these five weapon stocks uh, outperformed the S&P 500 by nearly 18%. They outperformed the NASDAQ by 23.8%. And they outperformed the Dow Jones Industrial Average by 12.7%. And as you just said, you know, hey, most investments actually declined in this period. You know, fears about energy prices, the fact that there was a land war in Europe. There was a lot going on that made investors and, and just the, the fundamentals of a lot of economies, not just in the United States, but around the world, kind of suffer. You know, concerns about food shortages, stuff like that. Two out of three of those indexes, the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ, they reported losses in that one year period. And I think it's important to remember that a lot of retail investors, a lot of people who invest their 401k, a lot of people who are just starting to dabble in the stock market and kind of want an easy way to invest, they invest in index funds. And for the most part, these index funds have been pretty good investments. You know, you're basically buying a basket of all the stocks in the index. Uh, and so a lot of people have their retirement uh, largely invested in these sorts of, of, of index funds. And, and they would have lost money in the past year, uh, while at the meantime, these weapons companies, who, who derive an overwhelming amount of their revenue from the U.S. government, th they purported massive, massive profits. Yeah, man, it's just incredible the way, um, you know, I, there's got to be some recognition there. Like, yeah, it's blood money, but hey, I got a mortgage or some kind of thing, right? Or is it just... I'll grind their bones to make my bread. And these people just don't care at all what's happening. I mean, for, for the most part, you know, what I, I, I started to listen in to the quarterly earnings calls from these companies. And I think it's really interesting. And I, I recommend that everybody do so because, you know, generally these companies, you know, they have their outward facing persona, which is that, hey, you know, they're just responsive to the Department of Defense and to the national security needs of the United States. And that, you know, that, that, that they, 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 they're just here to serve, which is, you know, maybe not entirely honest, but but it is pretty good spin, and I think it's worked well for them. But you know, they can't talk like that to their investors because their investors, you know, that's not their investors' top concern. Their investors' top concern is what sort of a return am I going to get on my money? So so that's where you start to see some interesting things. Like in January 2022, this was before uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, but you know, there were starting to be murmurs of of, of potential tensions there. Uh, you know, Raytheon CEO Greg Hayes he told his investors that global instability presented a profit opportunity for his weapons firm. He said, "quote We are seeing, I would say, opportunities for international sales." And he cited, among other global events going on, tensions in Eastern Europe. And he went on to add, all of those things are putting pressure on some of the defense spending over there. So I fully expect we're going to see some benefit from it. Now, flash forward, you know, these companies have actually, with, with their huge, huge, huge profits, 
again, if these are companies that are truly looking out for the best interest of U.S. national security and of the U.S. economy, uh, you would think, well, okay, fine, you know what, they, they could make a good profit. And given that, you know, in the case of like Lockheed Martin, something like 70% of their of their revenue comes from, uh, uh, actually 71% comes from U.S. government contracts, you would think that, hey, you know, maybe they would do the right thing and like reinvest it in their own industrial base and into their companies and into their employees and, and you know, all of those types of things. But that's, that's not, that's not really what they did. You know, in the case of, of, of Lockheed, um, you know, they boasted about their, their stock buybacks, uh, that they spent like $11 billion in 2022 on share repurchases and dividend payments, creating, quote, significant value for our shareholders. Now, that's effectively a partially taxpayer-funded payout to their investors. It's not a reinvestment of that money. It's just going back to their shareholders. So that's, I mean, you could argue they're sort of just skimming here, taking money that comes from taxpayers, an overwhelmingly overwhelming large part of their business comes from the defense budget. And instead of investing it as, you know, now we have all these concerns about the US defense industrial base, can we produce enough ammunition? Uh, all sorts of questions about, about our own production capabilities. Well, these companies, th their first instinct is to create significant value for our shareholders, as Lockheed CEO Jim Teichlet said. And that meant handing the money basically just back to them instead of reinvesting it. Uh, what's funny about that is how blatant of a uh, direct welfare payment to rich people this is right in front of everyone and putting it all in dividends and all these things. You might think if you had just fallen off the turnip truck or something that, you know, large corporations would, you know, dedicate a part of their operations to creating defense materials that the government needs for no profit at all, because that's their patriotic duty, because don't you know there's war to win and we got to defend ourselves from the people attacking us or something like that? Why should they profit at all? I mean, cost is one thing, but cost plus even one cent sure sounds corrupt to me. And if, after all, there's no real need for it, then I guess they won't do it. But if there really is a need for it, then why do they have to make so much money that they can afford to do stock buybacks and dividend checks? This whole thing yeah, is just insane. If we're talking about another country, we would be like, man, can you believe how they do it over in that other country? <laughs> right? It's insane that it's they do it this way. We do it this way. Generations on end now. And needless to say, this doesn't in incentivize you know efficiencies. That you look at like the the defense budget, it's it's ballooning. We're careening toward a trillion dollars a year in the defense budget when you really put it all together, and roughly half of that. When you think the defense budget, you know, you want to think nice things. Yeah, you know, I think most people want to assume that that goes to like you know salaries for for our armed forces, maybe uh, um, you know the, the the cost of maintaining bases. You know, things that, you know, you can quibble about the size of our, of our standing army and all of that. But, you know, that's where you kind of are hoping that money would go to. But the truth is that half of it goes to defense contractors. And that's not just like open bid competitive defense contractors who are going to get you the best value at the lowest price. No, this is increasingly a monopolized market by these five companies. And, you know, again, you look at Lockheed Martin, 71% of, of, of their $67 billion in net sales in 2021 were from the U.S. government. Now, sure, they're a private company in the sense that they get to hand a significant portion of their profits over to their shareholders via dividend payments and share repurchases. But when you look at their source of revenue, that starts to look an awful lot like this is some sort of a public-private partnership or, or just a, you know, a, a nationalized firm. Yeah, fascist and, and combine. Maybe, you know, and, and, one, and one can argue maybe they should be, in which case they would certainly not be handing that sort of money over to their shareholders. And again, let's look at where your average taxpayer is investing their money because your average taxpayer, uh, if they're invested in the stock market, has it in index funds. They're not overwhelmingly weighted towards these weapons firms. So they lost money. Their tax dollars that they still had to pay went to these firms, and then these firms turned around and just handed the money back to their own investors. Uh, it starts to look like something uh, pretty unpleasant for average retail investors. Yeah, absolutely. And then 70%, hell, the other 30% is the American state's allies in Israel exactly. and in <laughs> Europe. Because remember, Lockheed created the project for NATO expansion, the Committee for NATO expansion, and the Committee for the Liberation of Iraq. And all these things. And so it's their policy that they dictated 
that says that we got to keep all of these countries armed up with Lockheed products. So that's 100% of the game there is the U.S. empire is their market, period. And I got to tell you, when you listen to these earnings calls, as again, I cannot recommend it highly enough. You know, one what what there's a number. You know, depending on the circumstances, current events every quarter. You know, they'll they'll kind of talk about different things in terms of the outlook for them and their businesses. Uh, but one thing that I see them there are actually two things that I see them regularly that investors want to hear about and that the executives want to talk about. One is going to be, of course, the, the defense budget, whether or not it will continue to grow, because that's the bottom line for a lot of these companies and their investors. And the other thing is great power competition. And these companies and these executives are really loving to talk about great power competition because, frankly, that's where the money is for them. Uh, And persuading not just the United States, but other allied countries, especially in Europe, to invest in these prestige weapon systems like the F-35 or the, you know, the the literal combat ship, which it turns out the Navy doesn't actually want here because it's not good. Um, Those are the types of things that that they really try to justify a lot of their of their forward looking uh, product development towards. And and it's all about, you know, it's it's not so uh, uh, remunerative when you say, oh, well, you know, the future of armed conflict could be, you know, uh, non-state actors or any of that stuff, because uh, that gets more thorny, that gets more complicated, that doesn't have, uh, you know, the big clashes that you could get with, you know, the, that would use an F-35, that would use a literal combat ship. And, and those are the types of things that, that these executives clearly, clearly, clearly uh, want to talk about, they want policymakers to think about, and they, they want their investors, frankly, to look forward to. Yeah. All right. Hey, I want to play this clip. It's just short, 25 seconds. And I'm sorry, they don't say the guy's name, but it's Yahoo Finance interviewing this investor. And this is from a couple of months ago. Let's see. It was from, uh, oh, it's just from January. As far as industrials, my favorite sector remains defense and aerospace. This is the group that carried me to victory in 2022. I am not changing my trajectory with the geopolitical world the way it is. I'm still on Lockheed, General Dynamics, Northrop Grumman, Raytheon, Boeing, which is kind of a new one for me, and CACI International. As long as I have those names, and as long as people want to kill each other on this planet, I think I might be all right. Um, so there you go. Hey, as long as people are killing each other, I'm making money, my portfolio's doing fine, and you should be like me, and it'll be fine. I mean, hey, he's probably right. If you're strictly agnostic about how you invest your money and you know you want the most uh, consistent return and the biggest growth uh, in a period in time in which you know we are, uh, I think unfortunately, uh, careening towards uh, various forms of great power competition, not just with Russia, but with China as well. Uh, these are companies that are going to do really, really, really well because they profit from hyping these fears. They profit from global instability. Uh, they profit from national security threats, uh, be they uh, domestic or foreign to the United States. I mean, these co- are companies that do well when the rest of us are doing badly. That That's their bottom line. And I don't even think that they really conceal it that much when they talk to their own investors. Right. So how would one go about finding out what number to call and when and where Lockheed and Raytheon and General Dynamics are going to brag about all of their blood money like this, as you're saying here? You know, it, it's it's open to anyone. Uh, anyone can listen in on on their on their earnings calls. They stream it live, and uh, even better, both Yahoo Finance that you just mentioned, which is a great resource, as well as Fool.com. Usually, within uh, in my preferred preference pre- preferred way to, to to learn about these calls is to do it this way. You go to those sites like the day after the calls are scheduled, and they actually put up for free the transcripts of of the calls, so you can you know read through it at your own at your own leisure and uh, and look at, at at these executives talking about uh, you know. How how the world being a, a pretty dangerous and awful place is, is looking pretty good for their for their uh, for their order books. Yeah, man. You know, as uh, Andrew Coburn reported back when the little green men seized the Crimean Peninsula in 2014, he had a friend who was at um, some brunch or lunch or something in Crystal City with all these war contractors, and they were all thrilled and you know fist bumps and high fives and laughter all around. And I forget the exact quote or something about how ecstatic they were because, yeah, yeah, all that stuff about where we're friends with the Russians, man, it's over now. You get right <laughs> back to long range bombers and ships and subs and big ticket items, man. Forget the B1 and the B2 and we're going for the B21 now. We're going to do whatever the hell we feel like. 
Well, you know what? I think that that's, and I'm speculating here, but you know, one thing I've seen in these calls is a degree of enthusiasm for so-called great power competition uh, and certainly the, the Russia-Ukraine war uh, from these companies that I, I don't recall seeing to quite the same degree during the so-called so -called global war on terror. And you know, it's not that these companies didn't do really well during the 20, during, during the 20 year GWAT, but uh, you know, one thing about those wars is that a lot of it was sort of against non-state actors, and there were certainly a lot of war profiteering that went on, but the truth is is that kind of small contractors could get in on the grift, and they did in a big way in countries like Afghanistan. It wasn't just the big guys, it was everyone. And that's not to say that isn't going on in Ukraine, but when you start to talk about are we going to be able to compete with countries like Russia, countries like China, you know, that's where I think these the, the, the top five weapons firms, you know, that's really to them like catnip. Because for them, this is where their prestige weapons, this is where submarines, this is where, you know, literal combat ships, this is where uh, F-35s start to be, you know, kind of, that's the purpose of these weapons. It's not to be dealing with, uh, you know, somebody fighting from a cave. Uh, not to say they don't use them for that, but it's a little harder to market it for that. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, you could hear them on these calls practically salivating at the idea that now we get to talk about competing against you know china who have their own stealth fighter again again against russia and russia and china both have hypersonic missiles and this is areas th those are the areas that are like really high-end really niche and frankly like only companies as big as lockheed as raytheon as boeing as northrop as general dynamics can really compete in that space in a meaningful way right. so it's like this is right in their sector yeah absolutely Hey guys, Scott here for Leo Hamill Fine Jewelers out of San Diego at JewelryStoreSD.com. They do business nationwide. They sell jewelry and watches, specializing in engagement rings. You know, in case you're in love with somebody. They also specialize in one-of-a-kind vintage and antique jewelry, fully serviced pre-owned fine watches, such as Rolex, Patek, Philippe, Cartier, and any high-end brand. Leos also services high-end watches faster and cheaper than going to a factory service center. Leos takes all the stress out of shopping for jewelry and engagement rings, and always at the right price. They deal nationwide over the phone at 619-299-1500. That's Leo Hamill Fine Jewelers out of San Diego. Go to JewelryStoreSD.com to check out their fine selection and to find out more. Hey y'all, you should sign up for my Substack. It's scotthortonshow.substack.com. And if you do that, you'll get the interviews a day before everybody else. But not only that, they'll be free of commercials. How do you like that? Pretty good, huh? scotthortonshow.substack.com. Hey, y'all, libertasbella.com is where you get Scott Horton Show and Libertarian Institute shirts, sweatshirts, mugs, and stickers and things, including the great Top Lobsters designs as well. See, that way it says on your shirt why you're so smart. Libertas Bella, from the same great folks who bring you ammo.com for all your ammunition needs, too. That's LibertasBella.com. So, even more money and even less little guys to mess around with. Well, so, um, Michelle Flournoy, who I take it helped coin the phrase full-spectrum dominance when she was a lower-level flunky at the Pentagon in the 1990s, and, uh, of course, helped push for the massive coin surge in Afghanistan and then helped oversee its failure as Deputy Secretary of Defense for Policy under Obama there. She then um, could have been Obama's Secretary of Defense, but she wanted to wait for Hillary. Ha ha. And so instead, she had to go and just make millions of dollars at West Exec Advisors being not a lobbyist, but an advisor on how to get your weapons contracts over there. And she had said recently, talking about China, the idea, someone had brought up the fact that the Chinese have enough of these relatively inexpensive supersonic sea skimming missiles that we have, you know, some defense against with the Aegis radar and machine guns and what have you, but not really and not against like full salvos and so forth. Um, and that it's, you know, threatens to make our entire surface fleet obsolete or worse, you know, fish tanks at the bottom of the Pacific. And uh, although full of sailors still. Uh, and and Flournoy responded that well, we just need fleets of B-1s then. And we'll just take them out from the air. And we need to be able to, you know this one, I'm sure. We need to be able to sink the entire Chinese fleet in 72 hours. And we'll do it with B-1s. If they can sink our ships, we'll just hit them from the skies. And then, but not that she has a contract with the 
B1 guys or anything, you know. And, and I hear this, and you know what? I, 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 listen, I, I'm not opposed to the Pentagon having contingency plans for all sorts of stuff. I'm sure they have a contingency plan for, you know, Canada invading the United States. And, and as well they should. You know, it's their job to have these, you know, these binders, right, that, 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 that sort of explore various possibilities. And, and perhaps that should even guide, to some degree, the, 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 the acquisition of weapons. What I'd like to hear a lot more of, though, especially with countries like China, is we seem to spend a lot of time talking about how we would win a war against them and a lot less time talking about how can we avoid having to fight a war and how can we certainly avoid accidentally getting into a war with China. And when you're throwing around stuff like this, when you have an Air Force general talking about how it would be good for the marriages of, 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 of the airmen under his command if there was a war with China – uh, things have kind of got off the rails a little bit. We need to be talking a little more seriously about how we can avoid what would be a catastrophic event. That you know, it's one of those things where maybe you can win it, but you start to wonder what does winning really look like uh, if you have to fight against uh, you know another nuclear armed country. Usually, we've tried to avoid those sorts of conflicts. We're getting really close to it in in Ukraine right now, and 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 I worry that even some people who talk about we shouldn't be fo- focusing so much on on Russia as a competitor, we should be pivoting to China instead are purely trying to switch one for the other instead of asking some deeper questions about about what we can do with our diplomacy and what can we do to try to avoid the types of conflicts that really anybody, when you start to really sit down and start talking with them about what these conflicts would look like, will agree that even if you could win these wars, you don't want to have to fight these. Yeah, I mean, I think people are just in denial about the power of the H-bomb or the willingness of nation states to use them if they feel like they have to, which could be some squishy algorithm that you wouldn't agree with, right? You might advise Chairman (laughs) Xi that like, oh no, you don't need to resort to H-bombs yet, but he might think that he does. (laughs) You know? That's what you're dealing with is... And you 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 really don't want to be playing around on the margins of those types of judgment calls. (laughs) Yeah, seriously. Um, I saw a debate going on on the Twitters yesterday where Michael McFall is saying, you don't know that the Russians will use nuclear weapons to retain control over Crimea. And then Daniel DePetris, who's, eh, he's been pretty lousy lately. But anyway, he was saying, come on, man. Well, what are you talking about? We're talking about raising the risk of nuclear war and to an unacceptable degree over Crimea. And, you know, Max Abrams is a, a great, um, I, I don't know if he's a non-interventionist, but he's a really great academic on, uh, he's been really great on Syria and on Ukraine and a few other things. And and he was saying, look, nobody knows the future 100%. No international relations scholar could tell you or should say that if you do this, this is guaranteed to happen. This is all about risks and trade-offs. And who the hell does Michael McFall think he's kidding? And we're well, going to get in a nuclear a- war over the Crimean Peninsula? We wouldn't deploy our army there, but we're willing to trade Houston for it and lose it anyway? Or what well, are we well, even talking exactly- about? Well, that's exactly it, is that, you know, you talk and people say, well, you know what, like, Putin apparently, you know, was engaged in nuclear saber rattling, and maybe he wasn't as, you know, as close to using them as he kind of suggested early on in the war. And, you know, let's for the sake of argument say that's true. There's still this quality that, like, you know, and I understand we're, we're engaged in, you know, you're trying to make speculation and guesses here about other people's behavior, and it's hard to anticipate other people's behavior. Um But let's say you're wrong on one side of that equation, and you overestimate in the case, let's say, for the sake of argument, Putin's willingness to use nuclear weapons. Uh, the consequences of overestimating that, um, you know, m- might not be great, but, you know, th- they're, th- they're probably survivable. The Let's say you underestimate his willingness to use them. Now you're dealing with existential consequences. So, yeah, maybe people, I, I think, should be, you, sh- you should lean toward, if you've if you, if you got to lean one way or the other in, 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 in the speculation or in the guessing here, Maybe we should be avoiding circumstances where, we, where we're kind of saying, well, we're getting awfully close to a coin flip about whether or not this person might use nuclear weapons. We shouldn't be in that space. We should be looking to what we can do to try to disincentivize someone from using them and trying to set a, a global stage where actors who have enormous nuclear arsenals uh, are less likely to be incentivized to use them. We shouldn't be offering – we shouldn't be existentially threatening people who have second strike nuclear capabilities. You know, that's the whole idea of a second strike nuclear capability. Capability. That's the whole idea of mutually assured destruction. You shouldn't be doing that type of thing. Yeah. 
you know, there's that great uh, Jack Kennedy quote. I think it's from the American University speech where he says, should never put another nuclear weapons state in a position where they feel like they have no way to back down and still save face, which I think is such an important way to put it too. that. Yeah. People will blow up the whole world over embarrassment. Saving right. face means a lot to a lot of people and not just the Japanese, but everybody, you know, and you got to, you know, you get into a conflict with a guy like Cruz, Jeff, you demand that he back all the way down in Cuba you better be willing to give up your nukes in Turkey. Well, at least the Jupiter missiles, if not the plane dropped ones. You know, Absolutely. you got to be willing and, and, to make a compromise somewhere. Promise not to and, invade Cuba again. You know, and, and you and, and you have to wonder what sort of domestic blowback would John F. Kennedy have gotten if he had done what he did now. You know, if he had said those things now, people would have said he, he he's weak. People would have said, I don't know, he's an isolationist. People would have thrown all sorts of mud at him for essentially acknowledging that, you know what, when you have an adversary who has a massive nuclear arsenal, you need to treat them differently. And there are certain risks you just cannot take if you're being responsible. Yeah. And I, I think that some of the lessons of the Cuban Missile Crisis have really been lost over the decades. Uh, I think it's really concerning, and I think that you know some of the the the, the stone cold realism that people had during the Cold War, which led to some bad things, to be clear. But I think there was an awareness around the dangers of nuclear weapons and about avoiding uh, you know a clash between great powers in a way that in previous generations wouldn't have been an existential threat, and it became one in the nuclear era. And I see that right now that there's an effort to downplay those dangers, and I think it's really, really, really scary to watch. Yeah. And, you know, you just reminded me of another Kennedy quote, although I can't find it, but I'll find it later, where he said, and it was during the debate in the XCOM over the Cuban Missile Crisis, I think where he said, look, one nuke, if it went off in, I forgot what he said, Philadelphia or D.C. or whatever. He picked a city, I think. He said, you know, or maybe it was New York. One nuke goes off. That'll kill 600,000 people. And he said, that's how many we lost in the Civil War. And we haven't gotten over that in a hundred years. That's a good one. Absolutely I need that for right. the book. Absolutely right. That's powerful. Yeah. And that's just one nuke. That's devastation yeah. beyond any, what anybody could imagine. You know, I, I talked to a guy one time years ago where, you know, he had helped model this out and whatever at his job. Where, and he was... I guess had lived in Austin before, so he knew Austin. And he goes, well, you know, one H-bomb over Austin would kill everybody from Breaker Lane to Slaughter Lane. In other words, from the very north of Austin to the very south. And you'd be all dead, all of you. One shot, that's all it takes. And so two or three like that would kill all of Houston. You know, and if you just had like low, like one or two megatons, or like, you know, say high kilotons, uh, You'd kill all of Houston, all of Dallas with just one or two of those things. And 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 everybody and them burn everybody to dust. And it's just it's so unimaginable that people can't imagine it. Or it's so unimaginable that if they can't imagine it, they can't imagine that anyone would ever go that far. And so it becomes just not a serious danger, you know? Right. Yeah, the willingness of people to say Putin's bluffing. Maybe. He probably is. Actually, he has at certain points in, uh, in, in, in his nuclear bluster. But that doesn't mean that he's going to always be, be, be bluffing. And do you really, really want to play chicken with somebody who has the world's largest nuclear arsenal? Now, that doesn't mean I think that we should just roll over to him and whatever it is that, that he wants necessarily. I think, you know, there's all sorts of nuanced, you know, in-betweens that, that we can that we can figure out. And, and it's a good reason to try to engage in vigorous diplomacy. Uh, to try to address his 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 secure, figure out what are his existential concerns, uh, but the point is, you don't want somebody who has the world's largest nuclear arsenal starting to question, you know, if there's an existential threat to them or not. That's not something you want them to have in their head. Right, absolutely right. So I found it. That's the total number of casualties in the Civil War. Well, I'll, I'll rewind one. Um, uh, the generals assured Kennedy in October the United States enjoyed overwhelming nuclear superiority over its adversary and could easily wipe the Soviet Union off the map. 
But this did not comfort the president who asked the obvious question. How many Americans would die if just one Soviet missile landed on U.S. soil? The answer was 600,000. Quote, that's the total number of casualties in the Civil War. JFK exploded, quote, and we haven't got over that in 100 years. And he later acknowledged that the 24 intermediate range Soviet missiles in Cuba constituted a substantial deterrent to me. Yeah, sounds about right. What an unreasonable and radical position to be deterred by hydrogen fusion bombs, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, n- n- now we would say, uh, you know, that, that that's what appeasement looks like. Yeah, exactly. He's clearly <laughs> the Manchurian candidate. We need seven days in May to save us. We have yeah. John Brennan and James Clapper accuse him of being a Russian agent and fixing the election in 1964. <laughs> um, I've seen that movie before, a couple of them. Uh, listen, uh, what time is it? Oh, no, I got to go, but I don't want to because I still wanted to ask you something. But anyway, I'll have to... Um, Apologize for ranting all over your interview uh, because I wanted to ask you, I will at least mention, um, I want to ask you about this great article you did with our friend Ben Freeman, too. It's called Pro Bono Ukraine Lobbyists Quietly Profit from Defense Contractor Clients. And uh, this is a really good one. And didn't I highlight in here, you had something I never heard of, which was some, is it a new law that's going to try to restrict foreign funding of think tanks that's been proposed here? Yeah, th- 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 there there is a new law. It would uh, that's being proposed. It, it wouldn't. Uh, it wouldn't. I don't think it would prohibit uh, foreign funding of think tanks, but it would require nonprofits who receive foreign government funding to uh, disclose that fact. Great. Uh, just as a general rule, uh, there's no legal designation for a think tank. Something people generally kind of don't know. Right. Most think tanks are 501c3 nonprofits. So this is trying to address it in, in actually, I think, in a practical manner to say, listen, like we're not going to get into the games of saying what's a think tank, what isn't. What we're going to have to say is that uh, if they move forward with such legislation, it would be to uh, uh, to essentially require nonprofits that take foreign government money to simply disclose it. Full stop. No questions about whether or not they're acting as an agent of the of a foreign government, which would be under the FARA statute, uh, which would still exist. But this would just be saying, as a blanket rule, if you're receiving that funding, you just got to disclose it, period. Oh, Eli, that's a Russia-style law. Exactly. <laughs> I learned that this week, that if anyone copies America's Foreign Agent Registration Act, then it's a Russia-style law. Because <laughs> America has to be able to intervene in everybody else's country and overthrow their government whenever we want. Yeah. It's a very important priority of ours. Um, listen, you do such great work, and I'm so grateful that you and Trita and Andrew Basevich and, uh, and well, first of all, that you three founded this thing and that you brought the heroic and wonderful Kelly Vallejos to be your editor over there and that you guys are doing such a great job putting out anti-war stuff over there at responsiblestatecraft.org. There's a reason we find something to run from you every single day over at antiwar.com, as I'm sure you've noticed. So I appreciate appreciate all your great efforts, as always, Eli. Thank you so much. Hell yeah. Take care, bud. Take it easy. All right, you guys, that's Eli Clifton. And this one is called Pro Bono Ukraine Lobbyists Quietly Profit from Defense Contractor Clients. And before that... Ukraine war is great for the portfolio as defense stocks enjoy a banner year. The Scott Horton Show, Anti-War Radio, can be heard on KPFK 90.7 FM in LA, APSRadio.com, Antiwar.com, ScottHorton.org, and LibertarianInstitute.org.